Thank you for tuning in on this beautiful summer evening uh, when you could be out there enjoying it. <laughs> Hopefully you'll find this information that I'm going to talk about tonight of interest. Um, I think you will because it's a pretty timely topic. I'm going to be talking a lot about the extreme weather that's been happening lately and dominating the headlines, um, among other things, obviously. But uh, we've had a lot going on lately. So I'm going to start right in here. and. I have changed my title a little bit just to reflect the fact that um, we are in this situation with a lot of extreme weather happening. So this um, title here is related to an article that I wrote recently for Scientific American, Rough Weather Ahead. I think we could also say Rough Weather Behind. We've had all kinds of crazy extreme weather. So. Um, that's really what I'm going to talk about tonight is the connection between climate change. I will talk about the Arctic a fair bit, but there's a lot of other things going on now and how climate change generally is making this kind of extreme weather that we've been seeing, uh, especially just in the last few months, um, more likely as we go forward into the future, sadly. And just to kind of wake you up perhaps a little bit, you might have seen this headline uh, today or yesterday that this past month of July, which just ended a couple days ago, was the hottest month ever recorded, globally average uh, temperature on Earth. And it's likely it's also the hottest month in at least 100,000 years. This is really uh, an astounding statement here. Um, we are in literally uncharted territory now in terms of the warming of the globe. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for it, which I'll talk about tonight. And I should warn you that uh, I don't have a lot of good news. I have some good news at the end, but this is going to be um, there's a, there's a lot of uh, really difficult things that are going on in the climate system right now. But um, and as I said, you know, these extreme weather events that we've been observing um, are rise are increasing. It's not your imagination. This is something that uh, a lot of different companies and scientists keep track of. Uh, for example, the insurance company. This graph here is showing uh, how really expensive disasters, uh, weather disasters, have been changing over time. So this goes back to 1980. And what we see is a very clear increase in the frequency of these uh, very expensive extreme weather events. And this year alone has been a doozy, I would say. And we're only in you know, early August. So just wanted to look back on some of the more recent things that have been happening. Of course, the just brutal heat wave that's been occurring all across um, the southern states mostly. Sometimes it's just you know, Texas area. Sometimes it moves over to Louisiana. Of course, uh, Phoenix has been having, I think it's on this 30th day with temperatures over 110 degrees, just really remarkable heat. And of course, this really prolonged heat, especially in places like Mexico and the other Central American countries where they really have no way to escape it. Most people do not have air conditioning. Um, it's really devastating, not only to the people uh, personally, but also on agriculture, on the utility systems that, that are trying to provide enough electricity for those uh, air conditioners if they, if they exist, and the ecosystems, the animals and the other wild plants that uh, live in these areas being affected by these truly brutal heat waves. And of course, you remember the fires that uh, were, were broke out in Canada back in May, but are still going on. Um, you'll, re very, you'll remember very clearly the horrible smoke that enveloped uh, the New York and New Jersey eastern seaboard regions. Um, really a big wake up call, I think, to, to your area. Uh, you have never seen the uh, air quality as poor as it was during that smoke event. And those fires are still going on up there. Fortunately, the winds have not been bringing the smoke um, into our area quite as significantly as it did back then. But those fires are still going on. Now, these two events, that heat wave that I described and the fires up in Canada the, and the smoke that came down from them are connected. And what you're going to hear 
a lot about tonight for me is um, what the jet stream has to do with all that. So this little animation here is showing you what the jet stream looked like um, and still kind of looks this way um, during that really bad heat wave that struck Texas and Mexico back in June. And so what you see is that these blue words there that say jet stream, there it's a very convoluted pattern. It's taking these huge northward and southward dips. And those are those dips in the jet stream are what create these types of extreme weather. So the jet stream actually is a, a river of fast moving wind high over, over our heads, up where jets fly. And they it separates the cold air to the north from the warm air to the south. So when we get one of these big bulges northward, like we did back then, um, and it's still kind of in place right now, um, it allows all that warm air from the south to penetrate much farther northward, in this case, all the way up into Canada. And it, it brought those uh, really dry, hot conditions, and it lasted a very long time. So when we see these very convoluted patterns in the jet stream like this, we almost always see very unusual weather conditions. And this particular one created what we now call this heat dome that sat over uh, Texas and Mexico and caused that really devastating uh, heat that's still going on. So another uh, example here, you'll remember perhaps back this last winter, California had record-breaking snowfall, and uh, it really was um, and still is uh, going to go down in the history books as one of the most extreme winters they've ever experienced. And this comes on the heels of several years, in fact, almost a decade of, of really devastating drought. So down on the bottom right here, uh, this is what it looked like last year at the end of, of summer. And some of these big reservoirs like this one uh, in Southern California was almost completely dry. And just one year later, we see up on top here, the reservoir has filled up because of all that precipitation that fell uh, in California. So that record breaking rain then, um, and just uh, really changed this drought situation around. So now they're in much better shape. But we can look at the jet stream and see what it looked like during these conditions. First, the drought condition on the left here. Again, we see this uh, gray band here showing you what the jet stream looked like across North America during much of the time over the last several years. And the jet stream took uh, a big northward swing in the west. This takes the storms with it. So the storm track is also goes along with the jet stream. So the storms were going way up into British Columbia. They were leaving the Western states high and dry and allowing that warm air from the tropics to extend up northward. So that's why they had such an extensive uh, drought and often heat to go along with it. Downstream, on the other hand, when we see one of these big northward swings downstream to the east, we almost always see the opposite. And that allows the cold air from the north to penetrate much farther south. So we were experiencing, a, or in the east here, a relatively cool situation. So what did it look like this past winter? Well, just about the opposite. So instead of a northward bulge in the west, we instead had one of these southward dips, which we call a trough. And this allowed the storms to come into the western states. It allowed the cool air to penetrate much farther south. And so they had a very stormy and um, and snowy winter out there. So the, the bottom line here is that when you uh, come away from this presentation is you'll understand better, I hope, that the jet stream is really the key to our weather uh, in mid-latitudes. So mid-latitudes being between the tropics and the poles. So I wanna talk about one more very interesting case that you might remember back in February of 2021, when Texas experienced one of the worst cold spells uh, on record. And you can see the temperatures here on the right that occurred during this really uh, disruptive cold spell. Uh, these colors here are showing you that it was extremely cold over the entire middle of the country, all the way down to the border with Mexico. In fact, Dallas uh, at parts of this cold spell was down into the negative Fahrenheit temperatures. And at the time, Dallas was sometimes colder 
than parts of Alaska and parts of Greenland. So this was a very uh, unusual cold spell in that not only was it very cold, but it lasted a very long time and it covered a very large area and extended way far south, as I said, down into Mexico. So what was going on to cause this really devastating cold spell? Well, again, of course, the jet stream is involved. The jet stream now on this diagram is called the storm track. And you can see that it was taking one of these very large southward dips like this. So again, that allowed all the cold Arctic air in the wintertime to penetrate much farther south. But there was something else going on at the time too, this pink thing here called the polar vortex, which now you've, I'm sure you've heard of, but you might not really know what it is because that term polar vortex has been misused a lot in the media um, and just by people in general. So tonight you're going to learn exactly what the polar vortex is and why we care about it so much. So the polar vortex is somewhat similar to the jet stream, but it has some important differences. So in this schematic here, the light blue ring that you see here is representing the jet stream that I've been talking about. It's never this circular. It always has those north-south waves in it, but um, the jet stream as shown here exists all year round and it's about five to nine miles above the surface. As I said, it's up roughly where the jets fly. The polar vortex, on the other hand, is much farther north. It's much higher in the atmosphere, so up around 10 to 30 miles above the surface, and it only exists in the winter. Now, most of the time, the polar vortex just sits up there over the North Pole and doesn't bother anybody. It really doesn't have much influence on our weather. But every once in a while, this polar vortex becomes disrupted, we say. So instead of being circular like this, it can get stretched into kind of a bean shape, or it can even break into separate swirls. When this happens, we know that it has uh, a very important influence on our weather because those pools of cold air drop down farther south, down over the continents, and they make the jet stream take a much wavier path than it would before. And it also brings a lot of cold air with it. So when we do get one of these cold spells, when the jet stream dips south over the continent, this extra cold air from the polar vortex can reinforce it and intensify it. And that's exactly what happened during that Texas cold wave. You can see that there was another split of, of cold air over Eurasia over here, and that also caused a very severe cold spell over Central Asia at the same time. Okay, so now you know something about the jet stream, you know something about the polar vortex, and now I wanna go back and kind of take a step back and look at what the big picture is here. So if we look at what the Earth's temperature has been doing over the past 20,000 years, so 20,000 years ago is on the left, and then we get closer to the present time as we go to the right. And what we see is that 20,000 years ago, the Earth was about three degrees Celsius colder than it is right now, or than it was uh, before we started in the pre-industrial time, as we say. And when the Earth was three degrees colder, we were in an ice age. So think about that, only three degrees difference in temperature is the difference between the Earth being in an ice age and, in, and the Earth being in what we call an interglacial period, which is a relatively warm period. These changes in the Earth's temperature back then, before we came along and started burning fossil fuels, were all caused by natural fluctuations. Things like changes in the Earth's orbit, the shape of the orbit around the sun. Sometimes it's more circular, sometimes it's more elliptical changes in the Earth's tilt relative to the sun um, affect, also, also can affect the climate. So the last interglacial we had was about 8,000 years ago. And ever since that time, the Earth had been getting cooler up until present day. And what we see that starting in about the 1950s or so, the Earth wasn't getting cooler anymore. In fact, it was getting warmer at an incredibly rapid pace. So this says now at 1.1 degrees Celsius, warmer than it was before we started um, 
using the atmosphere as a dumpster basically for our waste products from burning fossil fuels. Today, actually, this month, it's, it's closer to 1.5 degrees Celsius warmer than it was back then. So already we're seeing a really dramatic shift. And if we keep going the way we are and not reducing our emissions of uh, what we call greenhouse gases or heat trapping gases, which include carbon dioxide and methane, we're going to continue to warm so that by the end of this century, will be somewhere up around four or even five degrees warmer than we are right now. And remember, it only took three degrees to put the earth into an ice age. So four degrees warmer than we are now is, is literally catastrophic. And we know that as we warm the globe, it doesn't take much warming to change the frequency of extreme heat. So this little diagram here is representing, it could be a country, it could be a location, it could be the whole globe. And what you see is that as that general distribution of, of heat over uh, a, a particular area, so it ranges between cold and, and warm, but as we warm that area, it shifts to the right. And it means that the occurrence of these extreme heat events becomes much more likely even with a very small shift in the overall distribution of temperatures at that location. And of course, we know why this is happening. I've already alluded to it. And here I'm showing you what the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has been doing for the last 800,000 years, 800,000 years on the left here. And we can see these fluctuations over time uh, up until present day, but now, the amount of carbon dioxide is way beyond what we've seen in even longer than 800,000 years, probably more like a couple of million years. And we know that those greenhouse gases, especially carbon dioxide and methane, trap a lot of heat in the climate system. And about 90% of that heat gets absorbed by the oceans. And as a result, as we look at what the amount of heat in the oceans has been doing over time, going back to the 1950s, we see that there's been a very steady increase in the heat contained in the oceans in this top, uh, very deep layer, actually, all the way down to 2,000 meters. So there's a lot of heat being stored <clears throat> in, the, in the oceans. One of the consequences of having the ocean store all that heat and also having the air getting warmer is that we get a lot more evaporation of moisture from the oceans and from land going into the atmosphere. Now this animation is uh, real data uh, from satellites looking down on the whole globe and showing you how much moisture there is, water vapor actually in the atmosphere um, all over the globe. So the orange and yellow places are where it's very humid. And you can see that it's mainly in the middle here where the tropics are. And of course, the tropics are known for their uh, extreme humidity and heavy rains. And you can see that, yes, indeed, there's a lot of moisture in the tropics. You can see some very interesting features as well, like there was a hurricane. This was uh, just a few weeks ago in July. There was a hurricane that formed off the coast of Mexico. You can see it swirling around there. You can also see these interesting tendrils of moisture that extend from the tropics towards the poles. And these have taken on the name of atmospheric rivers, which you probably have also heard of in the media lately. And basically, they're just conduits of this very dense moisture from the tropics getting transferred into the polar regions, both north and south, by storms. And that's really one of the main jobs that storms do is they take heat and moisture from the tropics and distribute it up into the higher latitudes. Otherwise, the tropics would continue to warm and continue to uh, accumulate moisture. So as we had said, as we warm the oceans and as we warm the air, we are increasing the amount of, ev of evaporation. And as a result, we're seeing more water vapor in the atmosphere. And this is a very big deal that you don't hear a lot about usually. That water vapor is super important because water vapor is another one of these greenhouse gases. So by putting, having more water vapor in the air, it's enhancing, it's increasing the amount of heat that's being trapped 
um, by those greenhouse gases and adding to the warming that we're experiencing here on the surface. That water vapor is also fuel. It's what storms feed off of. When that water vapor, which is the gaseous form of water, condenses into droplets, which are clouds, it releases a lot of heat. And that heat is exactly what storms use to uh, fuel their winds and fuel their development. So another aspect of this is because there's more water vapor in the air, storms also have more moisture to work with. And so we're seeing a very uh, noticeable increase in the frequency of heavy precipitation events, heavy downpours, heavy snowstorms even. And if you think back just a couple of weeks ago, those heavy, those uh, very destructive floods that happened in Vermont and upper New York state and Western Massachusetts, those are the kinds of heavy downpours that we're talking about that are being, uh, they're being amplified. They're, they're, they're pouring yet more water than they would have if they had formed uh, several decades ago when there was less water vapor in the atmosphere. And we're also seeing an effect on those uh, heavy snowstorms, which is uh, kind of interesting. Even though it's getting warmer, uh, this graph here going back to the late 1880s is showing us that the frequency of, the, of heavy snowstorms is starting to increase in these later years. So each of these colored dots is for a different city in the Northeast. Uh, probably Philadelphia is the closest one to you. And each of those colored dots for each city represents the top 10 biggest snowstorms that that city's ever had. And so you can see that those the cluster in the more recent years of those heaviest snowstorms, um, suggesting that perhaps it's because of this increased water vapor that's in the atmosphere now. Okay, so I promised I'd talk about the Arctic too. And uh, we're gonna start um, by looking at the globe again though. And you've probably all seen maps similar to this showing how global warming is not happening evenly around the globe. But this is an interesting way to show it, I think, because it's not just showing you the warming, it's showing you the warming relative to the globe as a whole. And so these blue areas here over the oceans mainly, are where it's warming slower than the globe as a whole. And the red areas, which are mainly over land, are where it's warming faster than the globe as a whole. And what you see is that up in the Arctic here is where it's warming the fastest of all. In fact, now the Arctic is warming about four times faster than the globe as a whole. And this has some really serious implications. One of them is that we're losing the ice that's floating on the Arctic Ocean. This animation is showing you how the thickness of that ice has been changing over time, going back to the late 1970s. So just to get you oriented, here's Greenland here. This is Scandinavia. This would be Siberia and Alaska over on this side. These colors are showing you the thickness of the ice, where the yellows and white colors are where the ice is very thick. And then where it's blue, it's where it's much thinner. And so as we march through time, what you notice is that in the early years, there's a lot more of the whites and yellows. And as we get to the present day, those whites and yellows are basically gone. Most of the thick ice has disappeared from the Arctic. And that is, uh, that's, uh, goes along with the rapid warming that I described up there. And why do we care so much about this rapid warming? Arctic? Well, it turns out it has a big impact on our weather. And we're going back to talk about the jet stream now. We talked about the jet stream in the beginning, and now I'm rounding back, circling back and talking about the jet stream again. So the way that the warming Arctic um, influences our weather is maybe you can understand it by this explanation, where if you think about a layer of air, that extends from where you are in New Jersey to the Arctic. So here's this layer in the atmosphere. We know that it's generally warmer in New Jersey than it is up in the Arctic. And we also know that air expands when it warms. So this layer of air is going to be higher in the atmosphere. The layer is going to be thicker in New Jersey than it is where it's cold in the Arctic. And this actually creates a hill in the atmosphere. So if you were sitting on top of this layer and looking down this hill towards the north, um, 
you would be you would be looking down a hill and the air that sits on top of this layer wants to flow down that hill just like water wants to flow down the side of a mountain so this creates a wind so the wind would be from the south towards the north but because the earth is spinning everything in the northern hemisphere gets turned to the right and so this wind that was formed also gets turned to the right. And that is what creates the jet stream. So the jet stream is there because of this difference in temperature between the Arctic and the areas farther south. Now let's think back again to what's happening up in the Arctic. The Arctic is warming much, much faster. And so the thickness of this layer is increasing much more in the Arctic than it is down here in New Jersey. So the effect of that is to make this hill less steep. So there's less force driving that south to north wind, and that slows down the winds of the jet stream. And we know that when the jet stream is weaker, it tends to be more easily deflected from its west to east path by things like mountain ranges and even blobs of ocean temperature that say warmer than normal or colder than normal. And we end up with a jet stream that takes these wavier patterns more often. Now, if you think back to those extreme events that I mentioned in the very beginning, and we looked at the jet stream associated with those, we saw that the jet stream was always in one of these very wavy configurations when we had those extreme weather events. So the idea here is then, as we're warming the globe, but the Arctic is warming so much faster, the jet stream is going to get into these very wavy conditions more frequently and cause more of these types of extreme weather events. And again, these waves, I keep talking about these waves, but they're super important for our weather because not only does the jet stream separate the cold air from in the north uh, from the warm air to the south, as we've already talked about, the waves themselves are what create what we see on weather maps on TV, the high pressure areas and the low pressure areas. So in this part of the wave where the winds are coming from the Northwest, this is where we tend to see high pressure. We tend to see clear blue skies and dry conditions. And, but in this part of the wave over here where the winds are coming from the Southwest, this is where we tend to find our stormy weather. And so with a wave situated over the country like this, we would, we would expect to see very dry conditions out in the West and relatively wet and chilly conditions in the east, which is exactly what we saw for the past several years that contributed to those really terrible drought conditions out in the western states. Uh, but fortunately, we've got a little reprieve this past winter. One other aspect of these waves is that when they are really big like this, they tend to shift very slowly from west to east. And so they tend to stay in one place for a long time, and that means that the weather that they're creating also stays in the same place for a long time. So when the waves are small, they tend to travel quickly from west to east, and when they're large, they tend to travel much more slowly. But uh, unfortunately, the real atmosphere is much more complicated than that simple diagram that I just showed you. This is an animation of real wind data that was created by NASA where the red colors are or where the winds are really strong. And where you can see we're looking down here on North America. And I, what I want you to notice, first of all, is what a god awful mess it is. There are all these swirls and all these crazy wiggles. Um, it's, it's a really complicated uh, wind system. But I also want you to notice that when these waves are small, they tend to ripple really quickly across the country. But when they get big, like in this case here, they tend to stay in one place much longer. So once again, when those waves get big, we tend to see very persistent weather patterns. That can lead to extreme events. OK, so as I wind up here, I wanted to end with I'm looking at the jet stream that's over our heads today. What's going on right now up there? So what you can see here on the top is the jet stream pattern. These blue colors are where the winds are strong. So you can see that it has these waves. You can see sometimes it's stronger than in other places. Sometimes it takes a big northward swing up over Eurasia like that. And if you look down below here, I'm showing you the temperature differences from normal at the same time. 
So what you can see over Texas and the southern states here, these red colors are saying that the temperatures are much above normal. We know that they're still experiencing a really severe heat wave down there. And what do we see in the jet stream? We see one of these northward bulges, just as we would expect to see with a heat dome under that. And over our area here, we see there's a southward dip or one of these troughs in the jet stream, bringing a lot of chilly air down from, the, from Canada. And you can see also the temperatures down here, these blue colors are telling us that the temperatures are actually below normal. You can see I'm actually wearing a fleece tonight, which is um, not what we were doing last week, that's for sure, because it's, uh, it's pretty chilly here in Massachusetts where I live. And if we go across the ocean to Eurasia, we again see this big northward swing in the jet stream causing this really severe heat wave that's been plaguing parts of Europe and the Middle East and a huge section of Russia as well. So again, the jet stream really has everything to do with the weather conditions that we feel down here on the surface. But that's not all that's going on in the climate system. I've talked about the Arctic quite a bit, but right now uh, there's a lot of very disturbing things happening around the world. And one of them is the fact that the oceans now are experiencing some really unprecedented ocean heat waves. So we have heat waves on land. There are also heat waves in the ocean. And this map here is showing you, again, these temperature differences from normal, but for the surface of the ocean. And what you can see, these red colors, there's a big area of uh, ocean temperatures that are way above normal in much of the North Pacific. This was actually back in June. Um, and the Atlantic also, just huge areas with way above normal temperatures. In fact, the Atlantic Ocean is experiencing the off the chart temperatures. They've never seen, we've never seen temperatures this warm for the Arctic Ocean. And that's what this chart is showing you going back to the late, the early 1980s. And it's just for the North Atlantic here, showing you the temperature of the North Atlantic and how this year right now, this was in June actually, is so much warmer than we've seen in many, many decades. And then of course, we've also got this uh, strong El Nino that's forming in the tropical Pacific Ocean. El Ninos are natural fluctuations that happen every uh, several years. And when we get an El Nino, we almost always have um, warmer than average global temperatures to go with that because this warm water out there is just dumping a lot of heat into the atmosphere and that's contributing to uh, the very warm temperatures that the earth has been experiencing. But so do these other oceanic heat waves that you can see in the Southern hemisphere as well. These are not natural fluctuations. These are happening because of all of that extra heat that is being trapped by the greenhouse gases. And as I said, 90% of it goes into the ocean. And so every once in a while, the ocean's gotta give some of that back. And this is why we're experiencing this hottest ever July on record. And that's not all. <laughs> uh, we're over the last, well, this is going back to 19, 1950, we can track how much ice is being lost by the glaciers of the globe. And this pink line is showing you, is telling you a very disturbing story because when glaciers lose their ice, that melted water goes into the ocean and it contributes in a very large way to the increasing sea level rise. There's, this is a very steady and um, a steady decline and there's no reason to expect it to stop. The other really disturbing thing that's happening is that down in Antarctica, so we talked a lot about the Arctic, but now we're seeing the Antarctic wake up to global climate change as well. And what this chart is showing you is how um, the amount of sea ice around Antarctica has been changing over time. So we're looking at the months of the year from January through the end of the year to December. And each of these little wiggly lines represents one year of information. So these are showing you differences from average, the average being the zero line here. This red line is what's been happening this year. So we see that ever since the beginning of the year, 
there has been less sea ice, not only than normal, but than ever before seen, as far back as our records go, which is into the uh, late 1970s. And it's not just a little bit different. For those of you who know something about statistics, this difference from normal is roughly six standard deviations different from normal, which is just astounding. And it's pretty, we're pretty sure that it's the ocean heat waves that are happening down in the Southern Ocean that are contributing to this uh, relative loss of sea ice. I mean, this is the winter down there now. The ice is supposed to be growing back but it's not growing back anywhere near as fast as it normally would. Now, sea ice, when it melts or disappears, does not directly contribute to sea level rise because it's already floating. But the fact that we're seeing this ice disappear is not good because it's, it means that the whole continent is starting to warm up as well, and the warm ocean waters are melting the Antarctic glaciers from underneath. And so this is really kind of a wake up call. And one of my friends and colleagues, uh, Bob Henson, who's just a wonderful science commun communicator said, this could be a major Scooby-Doo rut roll finding for people living on the coast. And that means you, and that means me. And we're talking about um, accelerating the pace of sea level rise. So this map is showing you how the trends in sea level rise vary around the world. You may not know that sea level doesn't just rise uniformly everywhere. Some places it rises faster and some places it rises slower for various reasons. But what you can see along the east coast of the United States here, which is where you are, we're one of the places in the world where the sea levels are rising the fastest. So this is not, not good news at all. So what are the main concerns for us living in the Northeast? We here again, we see the ocean temperatures that are off of our coast right now. You can see the, the very warm water. These are uh, differences from normal in the ocean temperatures off of New Jersey. You can see we've got a lot of very warm water sitting out there all up and down the eastern seaboard and particularly look at this up in uh, the Canadian Maritime. So as we said, you know, sea level rise is one of our biggest concerns along this coast when the, the things that sea level rise are going to also affect, of course, are erosion. When we do get a storm, that storm surge is going to ride on a higher ocean, as will those waves. This is going to affect coastal infrastructure and also degrade our salt marshes. Those rising ocean temperatures are affecting uh, the ecosystem in the oceans, the fisheries. We're seeing more toxic algae blooms. And again, we're seeing these stronger storms because that warmer water is putting more water vapor in the atmosphere and giving those storms more fuel to work with. We're seeing heavier precipitation events, especially in the Northeast part of the country, leading to more stream and river flooding and even perhaps uh, heavy snowfall. The flip side is we're also seeing more intense droughts. It really depends on where those waves in the jet stream set up. They're not all going to be in the same place every year. You might remember last summer, we were having a quite a severe drought in the Northeast, but this year, not so much. And of course, when we do get those droughts, it affects our agriculture around here, our freshwater supplies. And of course, we see a lot more wildfires when those happen as well. We haven't talked about tropical storms much, but um, those warmer waters allow hurricanes to travel farther north and retain their tropical characteristics. It means our hurricane season on the eastern seaboard is lasting longer, and we're also seeing uh, hurricanes taking more unusual paths. And of course, Hurricane Sandy comes to mind when we, when we think of that. All right, so I did promise you there's a little bit of good news that I can impart, <laughs> and that is that um, we are making some headway in transitioning away from burning all those fossil fuels, which dump so much of that carbon dioxide and methane into the atmosphere, and towards renewable energy, so solar and wind primarily. So this is showing us um, how much capacity, how much uh, electricity has been generated just since uh, in the last several years, so going back to 2017. But it's a very steady um, uptick in the amount of energy that we're getting from our renewable resources now. And we've seen the price drop dramatically so that 
if, if somebody wanted to build a new power plant, they're not going to build it with fossil fuels because it's much cheaper to do it with solar or wind. Well, unfortunately, that's the end of the good news. Um, if we look at global energy consumption and where our energy comes from, going back to the 1800s, we see that there was, of course, this big uptick in the 1950s. This was the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, and we are, have been burning a lot of coal and oil and methane. Those are the three main uh, fossil fuels that we rely on. And yes, the renewables are increasing, but they still have a very long way to go to make up for all of these fossil fuels and the co contribution to our energy economy. But there's hope. What can we do to help us get there? We can all do a lot, actually. Um, we can make some personal choices in, co in terms of you know the transportation that we use. Public transportation is great. Electric cars, great making your home more efficient, your appliances more efficient, and just using less energy overall. But even more important, I think, is getting involved in our communities because our communities is, are, is where we can start uh, getting more people involved. And there's a lot of things that our communities really need to do, especially in places where we are looking at an increase in various types of extreme weather. So we need to look at our our property and our infrastructure and where those things are vulnerable to, whether it's um, ocean uh, flooding or river flooding or drought or whatever it is. When we can help our communities plan proactively for these kinds of extremes that we know are gonna happen more often. We can help support our towns and, and communities in their transition to uh, more renewable energy and in conservation measures. And you know, we can all do a lot more if we, if we get on committees, if we run for planning boards, and we really get involved. It's amazing how much one person can do, actually. And then, of course, at the state and national level, one of the most important things you can do is to vote for leaders who understand that the climate crisis is a big problem, and it's happening now. It's not a problem for our ch children. It's not only a problem for our children and grandchildren. We're dealing with it as we speak. So we need leaders who, who get that, who are going to make some hard choices that will get us uh, away from fossil fuels faster and, uh, and really trying to get at this underlying disease that's ca causing these extreme weather events. One of the biggest things we could do really quickly is to stop subsidizing the fossil fuel industry. In uh, every year, the United States alone spends about $600 billion in subsidizing the fossil fuel industry. So think of what we could do with that money, uh, putting it towards renewables, putting it towards education, and helping people who are in harm's way uh, from these extreme weather events. We need to price carbon appropriately, and that means have the people who are dumping that um, those greenhouse gases into the atmosphere right now are not paying for doing that. So we need to make it expensive to, to dump carbon, methane, carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And we need to stop cutting down our forests because they are the best way that the earth has in a natural way to take carbon out of the atmosphere. So by cutting down forests, we're not only taking those trees away, which contain a lot of carbon, and that carbon will ultimately get put back into the atmosphere, but we're also removing our main tool to remove carbon from the atmosphere. And I probably don't have to say this one because you're here tonight, but um, educating yourself about these things, making sure you know what the polar vortex is, that you know what kinds of uh, changes need to be made, how big this problem is, and, and speak up. It's, it's not always easy uh, to talk to people who uh, think this isn't a big problem, but this is the message that we have to start getting out there. So in a sort of in a nutshell, what we need to do is avoid the unmanageable. So we need to avoid that four degree temperature change that I showed you on that graph that went from 20,000 years ago to now. A little, just a few, we have to, we have to avoid every hundredth of a degree of warming that we can possibly avoid, avoid because if we do get our, if we, if the earth does warm by three or four degrees, uh, the extreme weather we're having now will look like uh, child's play. 
and we have to manage the unavoidable. So we know we're going to continue to see more extreme weather events in the coming decades, and we have to get ready for them. We have to prepare our communities. We have to prepare um, ourselves. And um, that's sort of the two sides of the coin that we're in right now. So once again, thank you so much for having me, and I look forward to answering any questions you might have.